or underscore L will be used. These are the views I'll be using. And if we open a, a article, an article hardware gu uh, guide, then you will find this. This all underscore views uh, retract public uh, 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 authorization, so all users uh, can be accessed by anybody. First, I check once. Once I got app user access, I check the users. I will find this one. Suspect app NGR. Obviously, the name is not all something. Then I use an all underscore uh, to check his uh, authorization, his uh, uh, privileges. In real life, it would be a bit longer, but here I found a store, you see, uh, store procedure that uh, returns the authorizations, the, the uh, returns the uh, privileges once I check it. I check the uh, uh, store procedure, and if you see something like this in a code, a string if you see this in a string concatenation, then this is a code injection error, in which allows me to uh, change the select uh, statement content, and uh, allows me this allows me to access data that can be considered sensitive because in this user's table, to which I have no access to, basically, I have the uh, the salaries of these people, so the red part shows you how I could access not only uh, uh, the uh, users, but also their salaries. Rootkits, Alex Combust in 2006. Uh, uh, OK, we are talking about database rootkits, not operating based root system rootkits. So Alex Combust uh, 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 classified these. First, the first generation was about to modify, uh, were used to modify views and store procedures, which means that, uh, okay, so the user's view that we saw before was created by select, and we changed the select uh, condition uh, uh, so the hacker user does not show up when somebody is checking who, are use, who, who, who is using the, uh, the uh, table. The second generation, uh, already could, for instance, modify Oracle binaries themselves, so you could rename tables. And the third generation is, the, uh, is already able to actually work in Oracle's memory in the SGA, where a lot of things are stored. For instance, uh, you can do byte or bit flipping to uh, give yourself SysDBA uh, authorizations. David Litchfield had a presentation that dis examined this. He, he demonstrated that he that he could load a load DL, uh, he could load a DL in the Oracle process that opened up a share. Another one was more interesting that it allowed him to use an exploit and a buffer overrun to inject code into Oracle's memory that replaced system users uh, uh, password hash to something he knew so he could actually then log in afterwards as a system user to the uh, database. And I have a personal preference which is very uh, clever, uh, done by Denis Yurichev, who took out the object, the, the, the .o object file from an Oracle library. He wrote an object file himself in C and then injected this, uh, his own object file into the library and relinked Oracle. This is a second generation rootkit, if you, rootkit if you like. So this is the NURAG JIG point. In Oracle database, a lot of passwords are stored so Oracle can communicate with others. So these passwords are needed by Oracle, but obviously, they, these are encrypted. These are database links that are encrypted. The uh, EM passwords, MetaLink is also encrypted, which is a username password to Oracle's website. Here you can set a web proxy password or some database user passwords. And Apex is also uh, encrypted. Uh, the remote job scheduler has uh, stores passwords here, for instance. So what I need to stress here for Oracle is that what I'm talking about are post exploits. In order to get these passwords, you need to the highest level of privileges. And the database link 
uh, password is the worst thing uh, that can be published, but obviously, it ha and it hasn't yet. But all oracles specialists know that this is the uh, most neuralgic point of security here. What I'm going to show you instead of this neuralgic thing is how to uh, how enterprise manager is coded because this can be changed in 11G. I have highlighted 05 here. Okay, before 11G, you only had to call syscom.decrypt and you received the uh, underlying password. Since 11 years, it's not so anymore. Uh, the it, it, the key is stored in an operating system file, and the the O5 is highlighted here, and this is already a secret I'm divulging to you, because anything in Oracle that is encrypted and, and encrypted by its sequence and started with O5, O5 is this specific alg algorithm. So I take the first eight bytes, except O5. This will be the key, and the remaining part is the encrypted part. And a simple desk is, uh, is used to get it. So this allows me to get the key. Once I have it, obviously with high uh, uh, authorizations, privileges, I call this I call this procedure to call a procedure, the store procedure with this call, with this uh, password. And from that point onward, I can call syscom.decrypt and I get all the passwords. And here's the proxy password that could take me even further. So let's uh, uh, get then to the essence. We are talking about DLL injection. It's I've done this on Windows and in, on Linux. Although on Linux they wouldn't call it DLL. In window on Windows I used a very simple technology, but on Linux it's a lot more different, and there are not many examples for it. How you can load a library with ptrace and then change program run afterwards. I'll talk about this a bit more. For the time being, the proof of concept codes are uh, the proof of concept codes are 32 bits, but there's no problem creating a 64-bit one. As I said, Linux is a more interesting example. I found one example uh, at the time I wrote this presentation. That was the SSHF in Frack Magazine 15, number 59. Since then, a lot of things have changed. Also in glibc, uh, I uh, open. I used PL open to open a, to, to load a dynamic library into program memory, but its access has fully completely changed since SSHF. So this had to be recoded. It also had a more simple part. It uh, log bar calls, and in order to call f the uh, initial PAM f function, it only, it, 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 the only thing it did was to link the library, and w it, it became more uh, simpler to call the PAM library then. What was, in this case, more difficult in Linux was that on Windows, everything is DLL. But on Linux, practically, practically everything is contained in the Oracle uh, executable, which is 166 megabytes, so it's a pretty hefty bit. The injector program. Uh, links to the Oracle process using ptrace, stops its running, starts DL open, which is uh, a standard system call, so it must be there. Then finds the, is, uh, the address of is alpha function, which is also a standard uh, library. This is needed to find an address that does th that uh, is for sure contained in the Oracle executable. And then at the beginning of is alpha, it writes the shell code shown in the picture. Uh, the DL opens address will be in uh, written here once I found it dynamic dynamically in memory. And this is a flag parameter of the DL open call. It's also dynamic. I, I, I dy dynamically in the command line, I enter the command line access path, the, uh, the, the root. Uh, the jump, enter, and call start trick uh, injects on, into the stack. Before the 01, this access path, so we have prepared the stack for the DL open call. We call DL open, and we said, and then we stop pro the program uh, run uh, with a debugger breakpoint. Once the program run stopped here, I find in memory the addresses of the uh, functions I want to redirect, I and I also uh, find in the loaded library the addresses of the functions I want to redirect to. 
on the top picture, you see a redirected uh, call. This is a normal function start, but I use speed trace to get the bottom part. I only inject uh, two instructions, but ptrace for certain reasons uh, needs some more. This is the address I want to redirect to. If afterwards I call ret, when this is at the top of the stack, then this gets this is loaded into EIP, and this is the point where program start running will continue. So once I did what I wanted to do with the parameters, here is the here is my uh, function uh, using inline assembly instructions uh, shown in the debugger. I uh, uh, put the stack in order as if I just called the initial function, and then uh, the part that I rewrote. I have it run at this point, and then I have a jump instruction to jump to the part, to the unmodified part. And another trick, the last data I push on the stack is a memory address uh, uh, that will jump into the not slide of my f function. This allows me to handle the return values. Uh, instead of the original function, and I can even uh, bring the stack in order before returning to the caller. What, was, uh, what, are, what are the other differences between Windows and Linux? One is on, that Windows is multi-threaded, while Oracle, uh, the, the Oracle process on Windows is multi-threaded, so one process, the only thing you need is to attack one process, while in, on, on Linux, Oracle is multi-process, so you have to attack multiple processes if you want to redirect everything, but on Windows, the applied, uh, due to the applied redirection technique, it is not sure that I can redirect all calls. For instance, if a DLL calls a function it contains itself, uh, one that I uh, have already redirected in the Oracle process, then this one will not redirect. But in Linux, it will happen all, every time. The redirection will work every time. In theory, both problems uh, have solutions. Uh, Linux, this is a process uh, forks the Oracle call when somebody logs in. So it's enough to use, for instance, the shell script to check new processes. So in principle, it's OK. On Windows, we can implement something similar, uh, uh, like what we did on Linux, for instance, uh, in a next version, maybe. So what have I redirected? I concentrated on crypto because this is a uh, very hot topic, and secondly, because you can implement crypto, uh, crypto in the database itself. There are two implemented uh, two Oracle packages that implement this that allows you to uh, implement cryptography in DBMS code. If you have listened to me last year, that you will know that there are a lot of cryptography in the authentication itself. Uh, we have talked about the transparent database encryption, and we've seen that uh, seen how many encrypted uh, uh, things are stored in the database. The DBM sophistication kit toolkit was the earlier version, which was replaced by DBM Scripto Desk. It supports a lot more uh, algorithms. In Linux, these are called in the Oracle process. And if you look at the bottom, practically all functions in the package will be converted to these three Oracle calls. On Linux, on, on Windows, sorry, these are in, in DLLs, specifically in these two DLLs. And before doing the demo, I'll use this function for the demo. This is an encryption function uh, with uh, AS. I give it an input string and a key. From the key, I create an MD MD5 hash, and this will be the MD5 hash that I will use as a key within the encryption itself. It has its decrypting pair, a decrypting function. And then let's start the demo. First, I inject uh, into Oracle. For this, I need the Oracle process ID. And I managed to actually drop Oracle, so I'll really have to start it. OK, looking for the Oracle process ID.
And let's hope we have not managed to bring the database into a state from which it cannot start. Okay, so the transparent database encryption was introduced with 10G release 2. Unfortunately, the advanced security option, which means that we need to pay up to, to Oracle a bit more, it could encrypt in 10G on a column basis, which means that when we created a table, we could specify which column should be encrypted. In 11G, it, uh, the whole thing works on a table space basis, which means that the table space will be the file on the uh, that appears in the file system. And when I create a table, then I can say which table space it should be in, that if it is an encrypted table space, then the table data will be encrypted. The database is up again, so back to the demo. So will VS list Oracle? I'll be doing the injection as a system user, as you can see. That was it. And if we, uh, we look at the log, then we'll see that there is a lot of debug messages which don't matter, but, but these are not important yet. Next step will be to enter Oracle and on purpose by showing you the password, which is pretty hard to, 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 to break. <laughs> and now you can see that this is a, basically this is a TXT file. And the, you can see that the uh, password has been logged. So once we have done the injection successfully, anyone entering into Oracle, uh, we will lock their uh, passwords. So the log will write their passwords. Now, if we send the SQL select that does encryption and decryption at the same time, or it's obviously consecutively in one batch. What we see is that we call the encryption for a text of VVBB with a, uh, with a uh, key of AAAA, so we should get back four Bs. And if we look at the log window, we can see that we, were, we have managed the encryption and decryption. So these are the hash functions. Here we see the four As as input, and we see the result, the output. If we, OK, this is the encryption part with the key we generated before. The four Bs are shown in hex, and this is the output it was was changed to. Then the decryption does the same hash on the four As using the key, uh, de decrypts uh, uh, this thing, and we get uh, we get back our four Bs in hex again. There are a couple of important information about TDA. First of all, everything is based on a master key, which, however, is not stored in the database, but in a stored wallet in a file outside of the database. TDE does not protect data in the file system. Place the data on the file system, not in the database. So if you make a file level backup or pull out a disk, then it's about the protection of those data and not the protection of the database. Because if the wallet is open and we need to open it to access the data, then uh, Oracle's authorization system will decide whether we, ha we can get, uh, gain access to those data or not. What does it look like when we only have column level encryption in the T 10G version? As I said, there is a file in the file system from which Oracle loads the appropriate Master, the master key after you pr provide the, pass, uh, the appropriate password. If the user wants to access a column that is encrypted, then Oracle will 
based on the object identifier, uh, check the table key uh, stored in a separate table in the ENC dollar. This key is encrypted, so it has to be first decrypted with the master key. And once this is done, then we can decrypt the encrypted column. Anybody counted the number of encryption, decryption I used? Number of encryption, decryption words I used? The same happens in the case of table spaces. In this case, the column is not encrypted. The entire table is encrypted. So the master key comes from the wallet. Table space key comes from the table space file. I'll show you in a minute where. And when you select into such a table and you're not yet in the cache, then Oracle will read at block level from these files. It will read one block at a time. And that block obviously is encrypted. Then decry Oracle decrypts the ta using the table space key, decrypts the, uh, the block. And the clean text data can then go to the user. After the presentation, you'll probably ask whether this slide or the previous one had more occurrences of encrypt, decrypt. OK. Oracle handles files at block level. The table space key is the second block of the table space 5 plus OX 0100. And this is the byte that tells you the key length. Then the, it follows by a 16-byte key, which means it is 128 bits long. There is also an IV that you will need for a good cryptographic system. Each block has a separate IV, its own IV, to be found at the beginning of the block. In this way, uh, so this is uh, information I gained by experience. Before starting the demo, I'd like to ask my colleague Gergely Toth his effort to implement an Oracle wallet dumper in his spare time. David Richfield must also be mentioned, who uh, uh, created the Cat5 toolset, in which which contains an Oracle block uh, device, which means that if I have a so, uh, which I can use to extract data. I had to modify it a bit because my examples didn't work with it, with it unchanged. And I'd like to express my thanks to J, J. Dude's author who allowed me to view his uh, commercial product for free. This device, this this tool can be used on a collapsed on on a uh, broken database to still get out the data from it. I used it to. In check whether my table space files I created myself uh, correspond to the uh, uh, expectations of the Oracle database. As I said, everything depends on a master key, so I have to open the wallet. With this command. And if you look at the log, you see a lot of encryption, decryption uh, happening. But what is important is afterwards, but you can't see it yet. But a lot of W's should be here. So this is the online demo. I didn't really manage it right. But I can actually uh, get the wallet password. And I'll make another try. And now it succeeded. This is the wallet password. And before exiting Oracle and starting and continuing in offline mode, let's look at the contents of the table that is uh, in a in an encrypted table space. Here you can see this is the table contents. If we check these contents in the injected part, you can see that these are the data in hexadecimal. The lots of Qs and Bs can be seen here. So any TDE encryption, decryption can also be logged. 
In order to make this work also in forensic cases, or in case you only have the key, we first dump the master key from the wallet using my colleague's program. We have the key, but we could also use brute force to get it. And despite the name, this is the key we're interested in starting here. This is the master key, which is, and this is a key identifier. Once we have the master key, then I'll use my own small C program that takes the master key and a table space, an encrypted table space file as a parameter, and it will output the table space key for me, decrypting it practically for me. And we can also check if this is, if this really works. If we check the description shown here, it is the same table space key, so we even log this uh, attack. If we look into this table space file with a string command, we'll f find, I, I specified for it to uh, output to character uh, Change of more than 10 characters. It didn't write anything sensible from at the moment, but if I use my other own program that takes table space key as a, an input and the encrypted table space file and the place to save it to, then it will do that. And if we check the decrypted file, then we see the data. Lots of Q and B letters. So this was the encrypted table space. Before demoing the uh, column decryption, let's check how, what it looks like in the table space file. This is the row stored. This does the row length. This one does uh, uh, the column size. This is the encrypted column. It has an SHA-1 hash for integrity. Both can be uh, turned off for, for, for performance reasons. If we now attack this, I said that the table keys themselves are stored in the ENC dollar table. This is where I will use the somewhat modified Aura block uh, tool. I take out object 400 from the system table space, uh, the contents of it, and I'll tell it what uh, tell it what the different columns are, and I redirect output to this file. This will take some time. So while it's running, let's dump an object. Whose, well, one of whose columns is encrypted. I'll also use the Aura block tool here. And if we check the contents of this file, I dumped you saw about to dump from the table space this object ID and the object's contents are shown here. These are the lots of queues and in hexadecimal, and this is the encrypted part. We must be patient while this finishes running. Successful. And what you saw. The program that you saw has a different, another function. From this output, which we have just generated from the dollar ENC, from the ENC dollar uh, table, you see that I called the same program, but. The T parameter is now 1. This is a type. And I used the output of the previous dump. And you see that it even also parses the table contents. 
and these are already decrypted table keys. This is the object I'm object I'm going to investigate. This is the key identifier. This tells me the uh, encryption algorithm, whether there is or there isn't a hash. And obviously, there is, uh, and there is a separate program for this purpose as well, for the purpose of decrypting the columns. I specify the successfully uh, acquired uh, column key, the object contents, and the pla place to dump it to. And this is, if I now check the result file, I see lots of Bs and a lot of Cs. I uh, send it to that table. So as you could see, we can walk through the TDA, which may be very useful in forensic cases. Now, some resort remote job scheduling, which is a bit different, but not that different from what we have uh, heard about. Uh, it was introduced in 11G. Oracle itself has a job scheduling engine, and in, for it, in order for it to be able to run commands on remote operating systems without having to install a re to f complete database at the remote side, the remote job scheduling was uh, introduced. Obviously, it does need an agent. How does it work? There is a Java uh, agent, SH agent, SH uh, uh, that accepts the connection from the network. Uh, uh, SCH agent calls the GCC exit route in the Oracle home uh, bin directory, and the result is sent back to the database through XDB instead of returning uh, them through the same path where the queries came in. Uh, what is the security of the solution? It's not, not a bad design, actually. The network connection through which job requests come in uh, is encrypted with using SSL. In order to run a job, you will need a, a username and password on the computer where the agent is running. In order to handle this in the uh, database, they have created a credential object to which access uh, uh, rights can be attached. And it, for all this to work, the agent has to be registered into the database using a registration password. So it's a pretty well designed stuff. But what is the problem is that in release one, the data returned as the job results are not encrypted. As of release two, you can encrypt the return data as well. This is what a registration request look like. looks like. This is a plain HTTP request. That's an HTTP, uh, an HTTP server receiving it. Uh, it sends the certificate. This is the SSL certificate of the SH agent for, for the database to check if it is reconnecting to the right agent. Uh, the registration password is sent uh, hashed, and the shared key is returned, uh, is sent uh, encrypted. This is the shared key that in release two will be used to encrypt uh, the results, the, out, the uh, query output. Now, what happens in the database after we, reg we register? The shared key is stored in this table. We need high privileges to access it, so they are used in this table. This here is not encrypted. The uh, okay in this key is stored something else that is important, but I will not talk about it. And this is a credential. This is where I can create a cre credential. This is the way to create a credential. It has an object identifier, a username, and a password. And once this has been created, it will be stored in this table. Uh, it looks like in, in a form that looks like base 64. And this is the block that we use to uh, run uh, the command on the agent's operating system. Here I pass the credentials and the target. Now, the encryption of the credential password also is desk based and the first eight bytes must be extracted. Uh, we skip aside again. But this is not the only way to do it. I can also log it. This is the shared key. I redirected this function as well, so I can 
get grab the shared key used for authentication and these decryptions that are performed at password level can be dumped with with this uh, function and these are the uh, passes security too what can i what else can i do i can uh, disable uh, put file and get file I can disable job execution as a whole, but then why did I install the agent, obviously? And there are two important parameters uh, that allows me to d restrict users. I can specify who can use, uh, who can run commands through the agent. Those of you who sit here will probably know immediately which of these two parameters should be used. I have also mentioned that as of this new version, there is a uh, uh, an encryption. I said that in mixed environments we can guess where, where this will be set, to, what this will be set to, but it's a positive thing that if I install an agent like uh, like this, then this value will be true. So once you break into a database, you can uh, get out or log the passwords. You can send uh, requests to the agent. <coughs> the first line of the request is an HTTP request. It's not really an HTTP server. The Oracle agent uses the first three bytes only. It, it only. Anything after the get will be ignored on that line. What it, what it will check for is the username and the password and what I'd like to run. So we can escalate privileges uh, on the agent. And we can also brute, for, brute force another account. And two other comments. Here, actually, I link to the agent using SSL, only the th first three uh, characters are checked because the rest are garbage and I can uh, re uh, query the uh, agent version which could be useful for that hacker if shared keys use is set then this is what is allowed is returned which at least allows us to identify the f to, to 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 find out the fact that an agent is su such an agent is running on there this is only a place so to say but on a Linux but if you have a working uh, super SU, then be careful uh, who can run the JSSU binary. If you install an agent, there is another contender because we can run commands with a username, password, number of parameters, and a command. So we should then be protect this as well. This is why I'm telling you that you should handle not only sudo and su, but also G gssu uh, very carefully. Communication goes through two threads. So this is a multi-threaded brute for uh, forcer. Uh, one thread sends the password, and the other, uh, other thread uh, checks uh, the, out, the outcome. Since communication is encrypted here, Even if uh, that parameter is set false and we are uh, talk talking about release two, communication is encrypted, so I don't see what is happening, and I don't know based on the on the uh, returned uh, string whether the password was bad or not. But since this is a uh, plain HTTP and it's a content length uh, here specified, so based on the content length, I can I can I, I can know whether I have found the password or not. OK, but what if this value is set to true? Then I can log the shared key that I can then uh, feed to the brute forcer. If I want to brute force, uh, brute force, if I want to brute force another user through another operating system, then I can do it successfully once again. Questions? No question. No, no, we won't have time for that. In summary, never forget that the, it's not the operating system or the database that is important. What is important is the data. We can easily log in Oracle all crypto functions. This is not a bug. This is a post-exploitation technique. I showed how TDA functions and how uh, uh, data encrypted there can be decrypted. And we analyzed a, a, uh, the security of the job, remote job scheduling feature at last year's uh, 
activity. Alaska called my attention to it. The, the victorious jacket I did.